So you were born in 1938 and 18 years after that, as an 18 year old, you were part of a woman's, mm -hmm. a woman's leadership mm. that marched to the union buildings. Yeah. What made you take part in being a leader in that march? No, the, uh, not no, but mainly, you know, when we were growing up at home. I come from Port Elizabeth, born there, and there was a place called Coast uh, Village Board, part of Port Elizabeth. And this was a place that mixed people, of people of different races lived there. But it was a small little village. And their people owned their own homes. My grandfather owned his own home. And my father and my, his elder brother was given this home by my grandfather. And that is where I was born. The two brothers lived in this home. And the oldest brother dominated the younger one, my father. And my uncle didn't have children. So, so uh, this village board where I was born is my background. So we grew up there and because, and then my father joined the army. The older brother carried on with his wife and us, my mother and her three children, my brother and my sister, elder sister, I'm the baby. And because my uncle was domineering and he took advantage because my father wasn't there now and my mother wouldn't have any, she was a very peaceful person and she didn't like, you know, she, she didn't like conflict. And uh, so she went to, to the, she heard there was a new complex coming up being built in uh, Shauda Township. And so she went to Kew to have a name on the housing list, which happened. And when her turn came to get a house, and then we moved to Shouder. So we went to school in, uh, in, in the city of Port Elizabeth, Catholic school. Shouder again carried on there. So now the, it wasn't really that we were, but when my father was demobbed from the army, there was all this poverty around when my senses started awakening and I noticed all the poverty around us. And the semi-illiterate semi people used to come to my father because he was actually known as an educated man. Although he didn't have matric, he was like a learned man, the people respected him. And they would come to him for, to write his, their letters for him, make application for them, for their pensions and their grants and so on. <clears throat> and this is what he did. So my mother would cook soup and uh, give to the people. By the time we wake up, the yard would be full of people having come to see him and she would share what we had with them. And this uh, touched me very much to see the extent of the deprivation and the poverty that they went through because when my father interviewed them about, you know, they didn't know their ages and he would take them through, he had a system, his own system that he developed because they couldn't say how old they were when they were born. And he would ask them, Hoe groot was jy om die rinner pes? You know, that epidemic that took place and wiped out a lot of people. And then they would show how big they were, they remember. And so my father took it from there, that if they were so big, they must have been so old. So, so what is that, that epidemic called again? The runner pes. The runner pes. Yeah. The Afrikaans word. And the English, do you know the English? The English word, I, I can't remember. I did remember, but I've forgotten now. It was like a black fever. Oh. Yeah. 
uh, something like that, you know, like an epidemic. Yes. So I uh, normally, uh, where does this uh, instinct come from to have, at that early age, done the things that I've started doing? And I always feel that, for me, it was compassion, a deep compassion. And I think uh, this compassion came from my mother because she was a peaceful, compassionate person that always tried to serve people that were worse off. You know, you don't have that much, but there are those that are worse off than you. So what you have, you share with them. And this was a deep compassion with me because even as a child, if I see other children fighting, I wouldn't even know what they are fighting about. But the one who's got the more blood or beaten up the worst is the one that I would go and comfort, not knowing that this is actually the culprit, you know. So this was always my compassion, feeling sorry for the underdog. And wherever I worked, uh, the same thing applied. <clears throat> Coming to leaving school at an early age was mainly to go and work for pocket money. Because there were these factories in Port Elizabeth, the textile factories, and this French factory, owned by French people, uh, Van Lanes, where you could seasonally work when it's holiday time, young people would offer to go and work there and then go back to school when it's, uh, the school is open. And this was what I did. But then I became so involved in, in the uh, business of the workers and the, uh, what's his name, of the bosses, that I became a shop steward. And then after being a shop steward was uh, being appointed on the executive of the Textile Workers' Union in Port Elizabeth. That's how you... My uh, working background, and, and of course being now involved in the Textile Workers' Union where we were in Port Elizabeth was in a building where most of the, uh, most of our icons were situated, like uh, Governor Becky, whom Gov had his office there for New Age. He was the editor for New Age for the PE or the Eastern Cape District. And that is where I learned to know him and Uncle Ray Klaba and uh, Walter Nkwai, Vusile, Mini, all those icons. And they groomed us because they were part of the trade union movements to uh, laundry uh, and cleaning workers union, the food and canning workers union and all of that. They were leaders in different unions. And they groomed us and guided us. And then there was a thing that came into being where the uh, regime now didn't want the colored people to be together in a union with black workers. So it became a law where we were supposed to be, we were then known as the Colored Textile Workers Union and the Native Textile Workers Union in the which, beginning they called it. Which years were? This is the thing, the years now that I have to get, yeah, yeah. I'm not on top of that. But that was in the 50s. That was in the 50s. So traveling up and down as a trade union uh, member of the executive, coming to Johannesburg, then we start, there was the Saktu that was being uh, inaugurated and I was part of the, uh, the what's his name, formation of Saktu. As you know, it was a forerunner of Kosatu. So all of that, and uh, being singled out, because when we came to Johannesburg, we got uh, in touch 
or we mixed up with the Congress movement. And that is how I was singled out by the Congress movement to be the full-time uh, organizer for Colored Congress. And then the Women's League were all part of it. Now you become involved in all of that. So when you got involved in all of that, you moved on from PE yeah. to Gauteng. Yes, yes. Um, S started. North. Yes, yeah, so. Transvaal in, it used to be called Transvaal in the past. Yes. You were then asked to help lead the, the Women's March? In uh, being involved in the Congress movement of that time, because we were not calling it ANC. What, what was happening was the, color, the Congress movement as a whole, which uh, uh, comprised of the African National Congress, of the Indian Congress, of the Congress of Democrats and the Colored Congress. So these were the Congresses and their alliances were SACTU and the Communist Party. So being involved in that, of course, there were all these uh, campaigns that we were running. The Congress of the People were part of it. Uh, the potato boycott, small ones and big ones. Of whom I must say the women always uh, campaigned side by side with the men folk, with the, with the Congresses as a whole. Both, all the Congresses, not only Colored Congress or African National Congress, but all Congresses. Women fully participated in everything that was orchestrated for, you know, for driving uh, the Congress movement and highlighting the plight of the people and of the workers. So then I was full-time organizer in the headquarters. Of the, of the Congress movement, which I identified not so long ago to one of our, uh, I think you must know, Eric Ixon. I showed Eric Ixon, he was talking about uh, the, the path, the, the, all of that area in West and Market Street is going to be some something. So I pointed, and he didn't have a clue about the headquarters, which is around about there. But anyway, so we had this headquarters in a basement where we operated from, from as a Congress movement. These Congresses that I'm speaking about, except for the uh, Congress of Democrats, because they had their headquarters in town, either Jeppe or During Fontaine, one of those places. So in that basement, it was a very, very big basement or a large basement because it was a few stories up. And then the basement was given to the Indian Congress. Now those days, <clears throat> the Indian merchants around that area didn't want to be associated with the Congress because of the communist bogey. Uh, and also of other things. So they would rather give in kind and not become members. They would give in kind, in other words, they would give donations and then they gave this place, this basement. The building belonged to a certain merchant and this merchant said, you can use this basement for your work. And that is where the Indian Congress always had the most money most money that, you know, not a lot, but they, they had more than us. The African National Congress and the Colored Congress never had money. So we were dependent a lot on them. So they gave us space for Colored Congress in this hall and a space for ANC in this hall. So Comrade Tom and Kobe had a desk, they had side and I had a desk this side to do our work. And the Indian Congress, carried on their work in a separate office. And then we had a, 
uh, 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 or what's his name, room, maintenance room where we did our Ronio machine, which you call today photocopy. In those days we called it Ronio, you know, you used to do it manually. Ronio. Ronio machine, yeah. Ronio machine. Look it up in the, in the uh, internet. Mm -hmm. So all those things we did there, and that is where we operated from where we used to have our meetings, where we used to carry out all the campaigns, where the, the get-together place. It was a very happy place, because when comrades come from work in the evening, they would all come round there to come and see what it is that they can come and do. And if, even if there's a big campaign that we are running, we will say to them, send word to them that pass here tonight or whatever night and they would be part of the uh, the goings on. So it was from there that we operated at the headquarters of the African of the uh, Congress movement where all the or where the three con con congresses were situated. And on a Friday evening new age a later route versus team would come from Jeppy with the bundles of New Age and tell us a, a, a scream or shout from on top to say that they've arrived with the New Age. Are you ready? So they would roll the bundles of New Age down the steps and we would take them from there. And then later on Friday night, we will go to the Western Native Township bus rank and sell our new age. We were the young lions of that time. So we would go with our bundles and sell the new age for new age. So we had many caps. You were the, like in my case, I was an organized for colored congress. I had to, I had to recruit the colored people of Coronationville, the colored people of uh, the township that was that is now Triumph, that became Triumph, Albertville, Albertville, Coronationville, New Clare, Sophia Town, Newlands, all the way colored people lived during that time. I had to recruit them. I also was part of the youth league <coughs> of that time. I had to recruit the colored youth because here in in uh, Johannesburg or Transvaal, as we called it that time, we call it Gauteng today. The colored people were politically nil. They were not interested until the uh, issue of the colored classification came into being. And that was a very busy time because now I had to play the role of what happened is when colored people were classified as African and a lot of these people didn't have, didn't know how to, how to accept this thing or how to, you know, treat it. It was something that was very alien to them and it was also ruining their lives. It gave them a lot of hardships because you can imagine you are a colored family. And in that family, there is somebody, one of your children are very dark. And this is an offspring from your own family. So what happens, so suddenly this person is called to, to be classified. And I think you know a little bit of the history how people were classified with the pencil going through there. If it doesn't come out soon enough, it's coarse hair because the pencil is sticking. So then they make a note. Coarse hair. Coarse. Coarse. Like we say, cruz. Cruzara. Cruz cop. Mm -hmm. You know, the fibers of a mattress, now that coarse. So this coarse hair doesn't come out quick enough. The pencil, it sticks in the hair. And perhaps the person didn't comb the hair in the morning. <laughs> So this was being jotted down. Then that same pencil is put across the nose, measured. 
Whatever they are measuring is written down. The nose is too broad. Then the lips are measured and it's also jotted down. And that is how you are being classified by a stroke of a pen. You are now, your whole life has been changed and you are now somebody else. Which has a lot of implications because this now means and as you know, there were the group areas act. You live in a certain area which is de demarcated for your group. Now being classified, you can't live there anymore as a young person, a child, a son or a daughter, or even a father or a mother must go out of that group now to an African area. And all your, your schooling, you must now go to a different school. Now, what does that do to your life? So people came to the Congress offices for help and to Nelson and Mandela when they were still lawyers. So in the uh, Congress, in the, uh, in Saktu was, a, or the Textile Union was a Secretary General, uh, Miller, what was his first name? His surname was Miller. And his wife was an attorney, Shalamet Miller. Mike, Mike Miller was his name. So Mike and Shalamet were Jewish, was a Jewish couple. They both belonged to the Communist Party. And uh, Mike was the Secretary General of the Textile Workers Union in Johannesburg and he was banned. So the Congress movement then asked Shalamet, his wife, who was setting up her practice. She had set it up, but she was struggling to get it functioning. But comes the request from the Congress Consultative Committee now. How it worked in those days was this Congress component that I'm talking about <clears throat> their heads had a consultative component, which means that all the leadership of these different congresses sits on the consultative body to take decisions about, you see. So then from that consultative meeting came a request to Shalamet Miller asking her if she can take on all the cases that have been sent to the Congress movement for help in this classification problem. So Mike is an obedient, disciplined, dedicated member, accepted while she was still struggling with her own office to set it up to work and to function. And so the Congress movement again asked me for the, our, now we call it deployed, deployment, but that time they asked me to assist Shalamet, because Shalamet can't speak Afrikaans, people can't speak English. So to interpret for her and to help her write down different things. So I had to go with Shalamet every morning to the drill hall in Johannesburg where these cases were being done. Well, I mean, where people were being classified. And so I physically witnessed what I'm telling you now. The putting the pencil in the hair and over the nose and so on and so forth. So that was uh, an, an, an area where we could uh, mobilize around, <coughs> showing the colored people that this is what is wait. more worse things are awaiting us if we don't, you know, uh, belong to a movement to help ourselves and so on. And that was a very important point to make to them and a very uh, interesting, important mobilization uh, tool. But you, you did all of this during a time of 
brutality of the apartheid system? Yeah. Were you not afraid? You know, this question has come up many times when I'm being interviewed and reporters ask me, weren't you afraid? Not in general, they ask me, but when they come to the march, uh, to the march, were you not afraid? And I would say to them, I suppose I wasn't afraid. I didn't feel afraid because there's always uh, safety in numbers. But when you ask me this question of weren't you afraid, the brutality and all of that, you know, uh, when I think back, I don't remember having fear. We just did the work and we hear that they are going to come and raid and we are warned and we make uh, arrangements. We get our stuff together and we escape. We had an escape route. We had a plan for everything. So we always came and they were all sometimes the ones who were not very uh, lucky, you know. But we were always uh, breathing a sigh of relief when we were, you know, we were, we had escaped and we were not part of the net that was swooping. Like in the time, <clears throat> uh, the time when they were uh, picking up our people from for 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 the uh, the uh, what do we call this big swoop? The 157 people that treason, yeah. When they arrested our people for treason, uh, they came and picked them up by plane and so on. They landed in different towns or cities. And I remember the morning we went to work. Now, also our people looked after us, the ordinary people on the ground, which you don't know about but they appreciate in their own quiet way what you are doing as much as they are not part of it, and they respect it. So the Mapoisas, we call them the Mapoisas of that time, you know, the security guards. Those days they were mainly from other countries, and they couldn't speak English. They spoke very broken English. So we had this uh, security person that looked after the building of this uh, merchant, Indian merchant. So he knew us all as we came to work in the morning and so on. And I remember I lived in uh, West Street, right at the end of West Street, you know where the High Court is. But lower down is a place called the uh, Methodist Girls Hostel. In Joburg. In Joburg. In West, in West Street. So if you, if you come up Market Street and you go down West Street. On the corner of Western Market is this building where we had our uh, basement. You come out of the basement in West Street, you walk right down, you pass the High Court, and you go further down. Further down is the end, is this Methodist Girls Hostel. And there's a church. Now, I was an inmate when I stopped living with my aunt in Benoni to, look, to come and work full time here in Joburg with the Congress movement, I found myself a place in this girls' hostel. And they were very strict. <coughs> and I was always the one who was in uh, problems because of my work, meetings, sleeping out, because sometimes we don't have money to come home. We never got paid. So, uh, as I came from the girls' hostel this morning, not knowing that there was a swoop, meaning that the plane stopped and then they knew where to go and they had prepared for months and months who was going to be arrested and so on. So I walked up West Street to come to, to the headquarters and then this one Mapoisa comes walking to me. I'm approaching and he's approaching me and when, when he got to me, he said to me, please don't go there. So I say, why well, go away? He said to your office, to that office where you work. So I said, why? He said, because there's trouble. They arrested a lot of people and they've been yet three times waiting for you because they say they want the people that are working here. 
So he says, please don't, don't go there. So I turned on my heel and went away. I went back to the hostel. And then later on, after everything was over and done with, I heard from Comrade Tom and Kobe. I don't know if you know Comrade Tom and Kobe. Now, Tom and Kobe was the organizer for ANC that time. Later on, he became the treasurer general for ex in exile. So Tom and Kobe, when we met later on, he said to me that he was also approached by the security and they also told him to pack off, not to go there, he's going to be arrested. And one or two other people. So we were not arrested because we were helped. We were warned. So in that way, if you ask me if I was scared, there was always a guardian angel, you know, that protected us for some reason or another. You, you say that you were not afraid in numbers. I'm what, saying... What do you mean by that? I'm saying that, you know, uh, with a march when I'm asked, as you know, there were 20,000 women at the march. So when I'm asked by reporters, were you not afraid well, you will be arrested or something will happen? And I would say, no, I wasn't afraid. And then, then I would say to them, There's always, it's always been my philosophy that there's safety in numbers, meaning that 20,000 women are the numbers that I'm safe about. And if you ask me, what do I mean by that? Do you want to ask me that? Yes. The meaning is that we had a strategy. We had a strategy. And this is where again comes in the, uh, the silence in a way of the African National Congress, or let me say the Congress movement of that time when they weren't very keen, not very, not to say keen, they weren't very, let me say, interested in what we were doing when we were organizing. They knew, but they were not very interested or uh, enthusiastic about what we were busy with. It was during the later years when it became closer to the date that we were going to march the day that we had set aside, that it became uh, perhaps more known uh, by the media again, where they were beginning to, prom to prominently uh, write about the march and so on and so forth, highlighting it. That is when our leadership woke up. And I remember late Alan Joseph and Lillian and Goy telling Raima Musa and myself that they were called by leadership. So they said, we have to let you know what happened. We were called by leadership. And leadership were asking us in a very rough way, why uh, do we know what we are doing by uh, organizing this march? And then we said, yes, we know what we are, we are doing. And then they said, uh, don't you think you are putting the women in trouble? And then they said, they replied to say, no, we don't think that the women will be putting, we are putting the women in trouble. But don't you think the women will be arrested, that you all will be arrested, can, can be arrested? And then they said, yes, if we... But well, if we are arrested, the women will know what to do. You see? So when I say safety in numbers, this is what I mean, that there were preparations put or plans made or strategy being devised for that day. If you, if you look back now, today, that Helen Joseph, Lillian Goy and you and others had to go account, in fact, to the male leadership, or am I understanding it wrong? Because at that time it was dominated by men, and you guys had to go to them and report on. No, no. Do you know what you're doing? No, they called them. They, they called, called them. the two of them. There were summons? 
uh, it was Tata Sisulu. Okay. It was Tata Sisulu that called them. <clears throat> and I think they, they wanted to be, to make them aware. But, but for me, the thing is, why did they wait for that time? Why didn't they move along with us all the time? Because we had Leon Levy, late comrade Leon Levy. We had Robert Hesher. We had sometimes comrade Stanley Lawlin, who was the secretary of our Colored Congress, who sometimes accompanied us. And Robert Hesher and Leon Levy was most of the time accompanying us because we didn't have our own transport. We didn't have transport. Helen Joseph had a little mini, a little car, I don't know if it was a mini, which did all the driving for us when we went weekends around to other places outside of Johannesburg. And this car transported us. So it was always good to have a man with us. So Leon Levy as a white Congress of Democrat person or uh, late Robert Hesher was the one who was with us and one or two others. But it wasn't like, you know, we knew that the leadership knew that the leadership was enthusiastic and, and things like that until that late time. Do you think the reason why that happened is that the... They became wa worried now. And that the participation of women was, was not as dominant as the participation of men in the struggle against apartheid? No, no, I, I just think that they, they were lackadaisical about the whole thing and just felt that since they are reading about it, let me appraise myself about issues in that connection. Mm -hmm. that, that's the best answer I can give you. Uh, you go ahead. No, no, Please. let me hear. So the men was essentially the, the... Disinterested, except for the youth, like the Indian youth. They assisted a lot. Mm -hmm. The Indian Youth Congress of Transvaal. And even when the eve of the march, like the night before, uh, a lot of women traveled from their places and landed in Johannesburg. And when they landed in Johannesburg, some of them didn't know where they were going to sleep, but all they knew was the headquarters, which they came to. And like I said, it was a big basement. So when they landed at the, uh, in Johannesburg, at the headquarters, we were there, the Indian youth, so we looked at this number of women that have arrived suddenly, unexpectedly. What are we going to do? Where are they going to sleep? But the Indian youth as usual and the Indian Congress, under the leadership of Comrade Kathy Amar Katrada, he was the leader of the youth that time, quickly put their heads together and send the youth around to that precinct market prison and west. You know, in those days, it could comprise of all of the Indian markets, not what you see today, the stalls, the Indian stalls, fruits and all of that. So they were sent there to collect food, whatever they can get. They were sent there to knock on the doors and the offices and the shops of the Indian merchants to collect blankets. And this is what they got. And they came with it to the headquarters and we made beds for the women to sleep. So the Indian youth were 100% always assisting the women. Do, do you think that, that the struggle of women are unappreciated in South Africa today? Today and before, worse before. And I think even today's lip service, you know, is part of, of the fashion to say women struggle and give an understanding that maybe leadership or government is with it. 
and they may be with it, uh, uh, but not, I can't say 100%, but it's like a fashion, it's the norm that, you know, there is a woman's struggle, we are part of it, we give them uh, our blessings, we give them our consideration, and we support them. But it isn't really all of that support. At, at the reason Women's Day, a celebration of the union buildings, um, you were on the platform, and you 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 were giving people a sense of the history of the Women's March, mm. and there were other ministers yeah, yeah. currently serving government sitting on the platform with you. There was something very odd about that occasion, relative to previous years. Something, the feel, wasn't as it used to be previously. That you should be? Of, of the women, of that gathering. It was a little bit not as vocal as it used to be in the past. Why did that happen? Uh, uh, Do you, you get what I'm saying? It's like, it was almost like a... A, you, you, uh, there was something not there. Yeah, you see, for me, it should have been the highlight of all the August 9th, because it's 60 years. It's a, it's a huge anniversary, it's a huge celebration. And you are right, I agree with you, it was very low-keyed. Uh, and what came out of it, even myself, I felt I wasn't strong enough, because this should have been... The, the, the highest rallying point of women for that day. But I think they were mainly caught up. You see, there was a lot of uh, foreign visitors. Uh, and, and the mood of the Women's League themselves, as they were there, those ministers, that were not on the podium, that were there as part of the day. Because now they were part of of everybody, they were not there in their own, in their own uh, capacity as ministers. It was only the main one, uh, Susan Chibango, and uh, the president of the Women's League. She, they were the only two that were on the podium, and of course, whoever Batabile else. Hmm? Batabile Tlamini. Batabile. Yeah. Batabile, the president of the Women's League, ANC Women's League. Yes, you are right. I, I don't know what was uh, the reason, but of course it was low-keyed. It was the lowest point of all the celebrations in my view. I don't know, was it the excitement of the, of the statues being unveiled? But 60 years is six Important. decades. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, yeah. it's a celebration of note. Exactly. And the way... Life works is that if you get to 60 Exactly, years, exactly. So was there something politically missing? A lot. From that occasion? Yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, politically missing. What it is, I don't know. I think it's become a fashion again. And I, I think uh, 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 it, their minds weren't applied enough for the day. Because usually what happens is since Susan has been in office, and even before, I get a pack, which is the concept of that day. And everything, how it's been structured, was going to happen and for the whole few months. But this year, I, that year, I got nothing. Did the Women's League... Did the women's, it's not the League. Did the Listen, this thing is run from the office of the the Minister of Women's Affairs, that is Susan Shabango. And that is why I say maybe she didn't apply her mind so much because there was not even a concept paper which is usually sent to me to make me aware what, on what they base this year's, what's his name, celebration on and how they've mapped it out and all of it. It's a thick thing and I didn't get it. And when I asked her, at the general council meeting of Gauteng. She was sitting next to me on the podium. Then she said, no, they're not ready with it. She'll send it to me, but I never got it, you see. And the program, 
I got the program, but it was very low key. Is it is it because the the Women's Day celebration has lost its value, or has been its value has been slowly being diminished over the years as an important occasion in the in the calendar of South Africa? What is going on here? Well, Sophie, you've been around. No, I've been around, but I think the Women's League is not the Women's League that it used to be. It's not the same. There's a whole lot of issues that's got to be dealt with. And uh, the Women's League is on to other things now. It's not focusing on what is their main, their main preoccupation. What are the things that they need to deal with? Huh? What are the things that the Women's League needs to deal with to, to how give back the value of women's, the women's first, first of all, the, 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 the kind of woman that is now a member of the Women's League is not the same, and I shouldn't be saying that we must just apply ourselves to the old ways because life is revolving or evolving and life is changing and it's not correct to always hark back. You know, we must, we must move on. And new ideas are correct. And new ways of doing things are, are right, you know, are, are good because uh, it gives impetus to, to the thing that you are busy with. Um, I've been battling with the Women's League because of the way they wear their uniform. I'm about the only person around that I know, if there is anybody else, it's fine. But so far I'm about the only person around and I have been called by them to bring the blouse, the, they call it the blouse, I prefer to call it the, the uniform, to bring the uniform in perspective. Because at one stage a president complained about how the blouse is now even being sold out of a bucky and anything goes. And they asked me in, I was, I was on the NEC of the Women's League, and in this, uh, in this, uh, what's his name, they asked me to uh, speak to them on another platform about the, the blouse. That was in plenary, so all the members that were in plenary heard. The long and the short is that I didn't prepare to speak to them about the blouse. What I then did out of my own was to do a, uh, what we call a uh, project. And I asked my grandson who was still at UCT that time, if he knows a friend who's doing uh, fashion designing, so he helped me with the last year's student. And the student came to my house and I asked her, I told her what is the project about. And she was very excited because she says she will use it as a, in, what they call it, when you hand in your last year, when you graduate. The thesis. You know, if, yes, project. yes, yes. So she was very happy to do that. So what I did, taking her through, which you put down on, on paper, I brought an old blouse of mine, which is small for me now, and the pattern, and showed her that she must do this design, draw this design, and that she did. And then I had another pattern, which somebody left at my place, which is the wrong design, because the, the wrong design has got bad sleeves, I think, you guys know what bed sleeves are, all in one sleeve. And the wrong design has got the wrong collar. And the wrong design has got a, almost like a three-quarter coatie, not like a blouse that goes. And the wrong design has also got slits. So she drew that, you know, and then uh, I also showed her she must draw the, the, the skirt. Now in those days when we were 
when the, the what's his name was designed, we, we, we used a straight, what we call a pencil skirt or a straight skirt, or just a skirt with no frills on. So she had to draw the one that I showed her, my skirt, and then she had to draw, you know what it was, the right and the wrong. Now the skirt, I told her to draw a wrong, a wrong skirt, which is short, which has got frills at the bottom, and then another one which is long, which has got frills, you know, twirling all, all the way. And then another skirt, which is a, what we call a, what do we call this wide, the wide pattern. It's not a straight one, but it's wide. And it's, uh, it's not uh, just wide, but it's, it's cut into, into a pattern that makes it wide. So all that, that she had to do, and then she had to do the stockings. Now they wear stockings that are see-through, that are fishnet, that are all manner of things, instead of the black stocking, or the a gray stocking, or just a stocking. So she had to draw all those other funny stockings, fishnet, many, many things. And then the shoe, because the, the, the uniform has to be worn with a, what we call a court shoe or an ordinary heel shoe. If it's a high heel, it's fine, a closed shoe. And then she had to draw the one which is a sandal, open sandal with a high heel open sandal, a flip-flop. She had to draw other kind of shoes that are in fashion, platforms, all manner of shoes. So that's the wrong ones. And then, so that was the project. And then I did the history of how the blouse came about. And I put my aunt Goy work, working behind a machine. And then the pattern that was uh, born. And then I had other pictures over the years where we had funerals where the women were seen in these blouse. The main thing is that they are not wearing the blouse inside the skirt. They are wearing it outside, which is the modern way. So I showed pictures where they were in the old days where there were funerals, where Ma and Goy was buried, how the women had their uniform on, how it looked. Old pictures where the women were together with their uniform inside the blouse and so on and so on. Gave that history and the concept. And then this was, then the day came with the Lohotla when I had to present. Now this was now with Patabile's new regime. So she was the president. And then I was there to explain to them what does a uniform mean? And all of that and all of that, and I showed them on. And then we had booklets. This was in a booklet, for, plus seeing it on the overhead, and plus reading about it, and me even presenting it, you see. So uh, at the end of that uh, presentation, I pleaded with them, and I said to them, why is it that you can't offer half a day looking like this. Why is it that you must just overdo it by wearing all of those fancy things which is wrong, which is not part of the blouse? Can't you sacrifice, you know, just for that half a day or that whole day looking like this, ordinary? And then, of course, the hat, I didn't speak about the hat. The hats too. They prefer to wear this uniform with a big hat. And that we never used to wear a big hat during our time. We used to have a little clouch, which is in fashion again nowadays, a little small. I don't know if you saw what I had on on the that kind of very much in fashion today. 
and is very popular, or a beret, but not a duke, and not a big hat, or a hat with many trimmings. That is out. So this, that's how I left them. And I slowly saw, I saw, I see slowly, slowly, some of them are putting their blouses back into that because even that day they were saying, oh, no, no, Auntie Sophie, this is too much, my, my stomach. And then I say, look in your pack. Mama there, that the pictures there also have big stomachs. They didn't care about their stomachs. The value of the blouse, the respect of the uniform is what it was about. Do you, do you think that that many women in South Africa and men, basically South Africans, but many South Africans do not understand or appreciate a woman coming from those days, those years to date, even in your own political party? No, they don't. Because they've moved away from, from, from the time of, you know, they've moved away from the real issues. What is important to them is glamour. This is what I say to them today. Put aside your glamour for that day and just be ordinary. It's about glamour. It's all about them. If you see them today in Parliament, you find them painting their nails in public, knowing that they're an MP, knowing that they're people on the gallery. They don't care. They are insensitive to the people who put them in Parliament or the people who voted for them. In many respects, they are disrespectful. And I think for me, I think the Women's League is just a fashion. It's another cult. And, and the things that they want to do is not for the right reasons. What would you say? Ought to be the right reasons for women. Uplifting, uplifting women uh, and going out of their way to advance the women in the rural areas where the women don't know anything and to support gender commission. The gender commission is there to uplift and to, to, to promote the, uh, the, the instruments that government has put in place for women. And our women in the rural areas have got no clue about that. Our women in the rural areas don't know anything about gender and themselves and how they should be treated. They think it's part of their lives. So, the Women's League are not helping in as much as assisting the Gender Commission as much as, uh, what's his name, 21. A, uh, it's one of those NGOs, it's not an NGO, it's one of those uh, institutions of government as much. They should support the Gender Commission and find out from them how are they, how are they, uh, interacting with women. And I know that the Gender Commission is the worst paid. Their budget of all the Chapter 21s are the smallest. Mm. And they are also treated in Parliament. You mean Chapter 9? Chap chapter 9 chapter or Chapter nine 21. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are treated different, not differently, but they are always at, at the bottom of the, of the queue. Even when they are called to Parliament, they must wait the last out of all the chapter nines. Can, can I check with you? The can I just be excused for a minute, please? Yes. Excuse me. General, I need the bathroom now. Can, can we bring something closer to home? Because when I found you to, to, to encourage you to be mm -hmm. part of this project, you had a quite a historic concern that somebody like the women's struggle that has been undervalued to date 
The other concern that the struggle of so-called colored and Indian people in the liberation of South Africa are, is undervalued. And you were quite like very irritable when you spoke to me about it. Why, why are you feeling this way? The way you felt that time? Uh, <coughs> you see, when we were, as I'm uh, saying to you, uh, the Congresses, the Congresses, the way we worked, in the different Congresses, we were always feeling equal to one another. Nobody made you feel un unequal. And every piece of work you did was highly rated whether it was painting slogans on the banks of the bridges, on the poles of the roads. And everything counted equally, every bit of job that everybody did together with your Indian and African comrade, together, because we would go in the night at a certain hour of the night out of Comrade Cathy's flat. Because most of the time, his place was a central meeting point. If you leave Colvert House, if you leave Colvert House in Market Street, you will cross Market Street and go just around the corner into West Street and go down the steps of this building, the basement that I'm talking of. So we would all congregate as young people, young men and women, with our buckets of paint and our brushes. Not being scared, knowing what we are going to do, dangerous jobs. You know, danger, uh, uh, scaredness and, and fear never entered into your head if you are going to do a dangerous job. You don't give yourself time to think, am I going to be arrested? What's going to happen? And all of that. Your whole psyche is geared to what you are going to do. Fear comes afterwards, perhaps when the police pounce on you. So all of those things that we did equally as different race groups, and even when we went to exile, also the things that we did, and we came home together. It is now that you hear you are a minority. You never heard that word before, that you belong to this group of people that is known as minorities. And then over the years, you see that the, 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 the what's his name, of, of, of uh, non-racialism, which you thought was going to be the rallying point now that we are a free nation, and that we will all just fall on top uh, or around one another and be happy, was moving away further and further. And then, of course, there are all these laws that came into, into being. And of course, we didn't, we didn't complain about it. There is, a, a, what do we call it, a different, what's his name, in, in, in uh, government where, you know, you, you, the, 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 what is the uh, demography? The demography is the main concern in a town or a city <coughs> to employ. I just forgotten the word that we call it. Hmm? Demographics. No, not the demography. I'm saying around the demography is how we are going to have to employ, which is accepted, but there is a word, a name for, for, for this, uh, I've forgotten it now, that when you employ, you must look at that first. Proposal representation? No, no, that is for... Equitable representation? Um, not that, but anyway, I've forgotten now. So anyway, so all of those, uh, all of those came into being and you accepted 
that you can't be so many colors when there are more Africans to be employed, you see. But that's not the point. The point is that the younger people or the new class of ANC comrades, so-called comrades, doesn't understand that it was not only our African people that freed this country. They don't understand it, they don't know about it, and you can't tell them. So this is what is the problem here, that you are unrecognized. You never ask for recognition when you were doing those things. You never ask to be, uh, to be uh, awarded and applauded and to have statues about you. And, and, and those things you are grateful for today, for that recognition. But what about the whole nation? You see? So, so that, that is a sole point to, to, to see today that people are not taken as part of the whole nation, that they are left behind. And that a certain group of people are alone, you know, recognized. Surely, is, that, is that clear to you, what I'm saying? Yes. Surely, that part of the problem could be, is it conceivable that part of the problem could be that even the minority groups do not acknowledge their own contribution or understand their own contribution mm. in the struggle against apartheid. Is, is that possible? Yeah, and that is possible. That is a sore point. That is a mistake. Because uh, it wasn't highlighted. There weren't enough people around to highlight that to them. And as I'm sitting here now, I have said to somebody in, uh, where is our uncle so-and-so stayed there and this and this stayed there and so on so forth and so on, and I said, I want to go and visit them. And to tell the people here of Coronation, well, who was it that lived there and who did what? People don't know. But you see, it's not only the possibility that they don't know, they're not aware. It is also for us as leaders, for those that are leaders, leaders in the movement to appraise themselves we were in a hurry to get the country running, that, that is, in, that is uh, for sure. We were in a hurry to get a lot of things going that is important, that is up, uh, uh, uppermost. Uh, so we forgot about these small things that are more important. Because small things add up to the bigger things, you know. If you let go of the small things, the big things can't get working. So we didn't make our people understand from the beginning. Uh, we did from the beginning, but later on it started disappearing because in Madiba's time, he was very keen. And then too, he was criticized because it was said that it's too much for white people, you remember. And all he was trying was to bring all of us together and not to leave others out more than others. And then you were also criticized for that. Your, your African National Congress in a province like the Western Cape is in serious trouble. And you as a national leader, you have expressed certain views looking from national to the province. And given the, the nature of the demographics in the Western Cape, you had like strong views about what's going on there. Hey, because of the leadership, you had strong views in terms of the leadership of the Western Cape. Are you asking if I have strong views? Yes, you expressed to me very strong views about certain Say. individuals on both sides and other sides. Yeah, you well, were saying that they're not dealing adequately yeah, mobilizing the colored question. I, I was, I was, for me, I'm thinking that, or I believe that mostly our problem started as an African National Congress mm -hmm. 
party. Our problem started mostly when uh, the Premier, what was his name? Ibrahim Rasul. Ibrahim Rasul was removed. For whatever petty reasons, I didn't, I, I'm not aware of, I'm not familiar with the reasons that he is, uh, that he's been removed. But from that time, things went wrong and it, it started going badly worse and worse from the time that Rasul. And I remember for the first time I heard Mantash talking about when he was telling us that people must understand we were in a little forum, which I belong to, and he said, people must understand the history of the Western Cape. And he spoke about the earlier years of the influx of slaves. And he says, this is what the people don't understand. What Mantash didn't know he was driving to that time for me, what he was driving to that time was now, what is happening now, that the Cape will never go back to the ANC. They've lost it. But Mantash understood when his remarks, uh, what's his name, bordered on the history of the Cape slaves, the Western Cape slaves and how they came into the country, which was an eye-opener, which although he kept quiet and he probably, probably realized today that that is the, the full impact of, of that province of that history. And you see, uh, when, and, and it shows you that when they remove Russell, the people of the Western Cape probably resolved that it will never be the same again. But also with the Western Cape having been taken over by the DA, it's either that the DA is ruling the way the people of the Western Cape wants them to rule, they're doing something right, even if they're doing some things wrong, but it does show that things are far better than they used to be. You, you are st a stalwart of the African National Congress and you're a tried and tested leader, you've been out of exile, um, you came back, you've been harassed many a times, um, and then you have this fractures that's going on within the African National Congress and it spills over into government. What, what? There's a, there's a element that says things were not resolved before in exile amongst a couple of leaders. And now what we're experiencing is the remnants of unresolved issues. Have you heard about people arguing that? Mm, I hear about that. I hear about that. Um, I'm not sure what things are, have not been resolved, but what I f believe is that from that time, from that time, you see, I was never favored. I, I'm still going to see your transcript when you finish, but this is just off the cuff. I was never a favorite of anybody in exile because I always insisted, don't let's put things under the carpet. I was always the wild one that speaks truth to power. And when we were as a woman's section, not a woman's league in exile, because there we were not calling ourselves women's league, ANC women's league, we called ourselves women's section. And when things were messy, then the leadership of women's section would say to us, as women's section members, so and so and so and so and so and so will come here tomorrow to speak to us 
and if they are asked uh, tough questions, don't say this and this and this and this. And out of all the women, I would say, but why are you telling us to say what you want us to say? Why must we sweep things under the carpet? Why can't we say things the way they are? And what is happening? All along my life, I've been coming with that policy. Up to Saturday, when I was in another forum which I belonged to. You remember with the hoax email, I was on that commission. And the whole lineup of the people who came to submit was the president, Tabombeki, the deputy, who is today the president, and all the cabinet ministers. And my one question to them over the time that we were sitting there was why is it, not to them, but to the different ones that come to submit, and that day it was uh, Malacca. I've been asking this question with others too, but they didn't know until Mbete that day submitted and I asked her the question. I say, why is it that when you are sitting in a NEC meeting in some institute, in some place, in some building, all of you as NEC members, and you discuss and deliberate what you are deliberating. And when you are ending or finishing with your meeting, you go your way. And when you are driving in the roads of Johannesburg, the, 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 the posters on the wall of this evening's papers are shouting what you have been discussing today. It's there in bold letters telling you what you've been talking about today. And she also felt very un uncomfortable like the others. And I said to her, did you ever as a NEC try to find out who is leaking, has been leaking over the years? And she very, very truthfully says, yes, we did. And she said, during the time of Madiba, this was happening. In fact, it never stopped over the years. And she said that Madiba then appointed a little task team to investigate who are the people that are leaking. And she says, and in truth, the report was given to Madiba. And when he saw the report and he looked at the names of the people in the NEC who were leaking, he said, but how can I? How can this be? If I inform all of you, we are going to break this movement in half. My answer to her was the same of Saturday, was the same of all the time where I said, but why should these things be hidden or kept? a secret for the sake of keeping or for the sake of not breaking the movement in half as it is the movement is already breaking up and why don't we become bold enough to see that if we reveal these names it won't heal the thing then to break it further So my contention is that sweeping things under the carpet, it can't stay there forever. It eventually finds its way out. And it has greater impact. It's like something that has happened to a person where it has not been spoken about. You know the psychology things that you guys know about. And if something bad happened to you, and you've not spoken about it and you hide it or you keep it inside of you, it gives you 
a some disease and it gives you, you become unhealthy, it becomes sick and all of that. And if it's not treated, if it's not treated, it's going to, it's going to explode somewhere. So rather talk about it, open up about it, get people together and, and, and see a way how we can mend it. But if we keep sweeping like we've been do doing over the centuries or over the decades, this is the result. For me, this is no surprise. When O Papu and I had a discussion after, after, uh, after Polokwana and things start to unravel, hope came to me and he spoke to me about it and how sad he is about these things. And I said to him, yes, hope, this is the beginning. And it's not going to change. And he was very worried. He looked at me, what do you mean, and so forth, what is not? I said, it's going to become worse. It's never going to be changed. In fact, it's going to become worse. After a year, hope and I, we did meet over a period of time, but one year after, hope said, and so forth, I'm here to ask you, did you mean what you said that time, that things will never come right. I said, yes, I meant it. And here it is today, 2016. It's not coming right. You, you, you're part of the elders. How do you guys see fixing the problem of factions? Factionalism and all the things that that has an impact on this organization. How are you guys seeing? How are we seeing it? To be fact, to be fixed. You're the elders. You're the leadership of this organization that's more than a century old, and in fact, most of your lifetime you spend in this organization. Since the age of 18. You, you, you see, uh, it's, it's okay to be an elder and part of the elder group, like you call it, the, the, the what, uh, what do you call it again? The eminent. No, no, you call it the... Uh, group of elders. Yeah, but the top six, what the, the they, they take... Office bearers. Yeah, but they take it the... Joint responsibility, what do they call it again? Collective. Collective. The collective. The collective. I'm talking about the elders. Yeah, the now I'm saying to you, it's okay to be seen as elders, and you say you, the elders. For me, it's, when you say you, the elders, it's okay for us as elders, as a collective, to see it in a certain way. But you as an individual, as an elder, I have my own individual analysis, my own individual thinking, my own individual feeling. And I don't really have to be seen as a collective, seeing it the same way as they do. And this is where we differ. And even as elders, we disagree seriously about how we see things and how we analyze things. Well, we are in agreement of the analysis of the whole thing. But how to fix it? How to fix it is the hard part, which others can't agree on your way of. Can it be fixed, the problems? No. So what is the solution then? A whole new regime as we said in the old days, we will destroy this apartheid and bring it down brick by brick. I don't believe anything can be salvaged. That any of the NEC or the top six or even whatever structures that are prominent can go back. It should be a whole house broken down, destroyed and build a new house. That is what I think. 
with new leadership. It doesn't matter who that leadership is. It doesn't have to be ANC people. It doesn't have to. It, has, it can be anybody that is, has got the values. What we are now looking for, what I am personally saying, is the person with the right frame of mind. Frame of mind, we have the right kind of values. Or the ethics. What are they? They are a number of things. Integrity, honesty. I have said to, I have said to Makuru, when I handed over Makuru, the report, David, the premier of the David Makuru, yeah. I've said to him, when we handed over the report, you remember the Mamezi case? I was on that IC that the Gauteng province established after that resolution. The national was late in establishing this national one. But Gauteng established their one first. So when we were investigating the Mamezi case, and we had a whole pack of vouchers, of stubs, of pay points of everything, of his credit card, every copy of everything. And when he appeared in front of us, the man didn't know his job. It was my advisor that told me. It was my chief of staff that said I must. It was my and I asked him, but Comrade Mamezi, you are the MEC. Why do you have to ask your advisor if you have to do this and all of that and so on? The man was dancing around. He didn't have a clue about his work. Not a clue. And when we handed over that report, I said to David, this is a report. And please, if this report is not accepted in the recommendations that we are making, don't ever call me again to be part of anything. Because I'm asking you, you are sitting there with his top five. And I said, let me ask you, when you as leadership look for people to appoint to top positions, what is it? in them. What is it in them that you see that they deserve to be this, they deserve this position? And he looked at me and I said, is it that you see this man can verbalize? Do you see that this man can interrogate a document? Can this man, have, what kind of skills does he have? Is he up to date with the different preambles in the constitution of the ANC or the constitution of the country? What is it that you look for? How do you know him? Is, if David was taken aback. And I asked, do you know this person to have integrity, to be an honest person? And, and so on. So you see, this is what we don't do. We don't do those things. We just put people with, there's many, many stories that are not happy ones that I can quote to you as we are sitting here to make you understand what is going on. Why have we come this far? Why are we sitting on the precipice? Why are we ready to implode? Because of all these numerous things that we didn't make ourselves, give ourselves time for, 
to take note of. We are too busy. As a premier, as a MEC, we are too busy as a leader. Whatever the meaning of a leader means, I don't know. For me, a leader should be the kind of person that doesn't say, I'm going to my office. The kind of vocabulary that we should instill into ourselves is to say, I'm going to where I'm serving. I'm going to that office. I serve there. The kind of person that don't say this is my PA or my secretary, but to say I work with this person. She assists me. He assists me in my office. Not my, my, my. Because those people stay behind and you move on. You are just there for a period of time, not forever. It doesn't belong to you. That office isn't my office. It's the office in which I serve. I work in there. And that is what I feel. True leaders should be doing and saying all the time and feeling and expressing and demonstrating that kind of leadership. That when you introduce your PA, you say, she works, this is so-and-so, she works with me, he works with me. This is my of the office that I serve in. Well, this is Sophie the Brain. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for teaching us. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate it. I hope I've I've been able to help you that you have uh I want to give you a big hug. Oh, sure. <laughs>